to you today on three separate topics. These are burns, trauma and zoonoses. We will start with infections in burns and these are some of the things I will go over with you to understand the clinical manifestations, diagnosis and treatment of burn wound infections, to identify appropriate management of sepsis in these patients and to understand basic principles of infection control in the burn unit. Now burn wound sepsis has declined from earlier from about 6 to 1 percent but still there is significant morbidity once your total burn surface area exceeds 15 percent. And you also have an increased morbidity if your burns occur in the lower extremities although the bugs tend to remain the same. Patients with burn wound infections also have other types of hospital acquired infections, typically catheter related infections. For instance, in this, uh, in this series of 175 patients, there was uh, multi organ dysfunction in 83 uh, percent as a direct cause of death. Who is at risk from severe burns? Basically those who sustain more than 20 percent burns. Uh, in management of burn wounds, topical therapy is associated with a higher incidence of burn wound infection and graft loss compared with early excision and grafting, which is a significant change over the years in management of these patients. Delaying burn wound excision increases bacterial loads and gram negative colonization. And when bacterial counts exceed 10 power 5 organisms per gram of tissue, that is a strong risk factor for developing infection even when the burn wounds are excised. Despite the ability of burn wound excision to decrease bacterial counts, sepsis continues to take a significant toll on these patients. What is the microbiology of these infections? Typically early on you see gram positive organisms, typically Staphylococcus aureus, Enterococcus species. Later on gram negatives take over classically Pseudomonas aeruginosa followed by Enterobacteriaceae. In recent years, we have seen increased incidences of MRSA, Stenotrophomonas and Acinetobacter directly related to the antibiotic exposure these patients get. Finally, Candida takes over as you use more antibiotics and with more prolonged hospital stay and the important virus in a burn setting is herpes simplex, usually type 1. You can also kind of predict what your organism will be based upon the epidemiologic risk factors. For instance, gram positive organisms, staph and strep typically early on, gram negative organisms dominate after 5 days. This is when you start seeing Pseudomonas, Klebsiella and you also need to know the sensitivities in your own unit that is crucial to developing appropriate empiric antibiotic therapy. Once you have gram negative or broad spectrum cover on board, Candida comes in and often colonization precedes and is, a, and is an important clue to clinical infection. Finally, more resistant bacteria, for instance, Stenotrophomonas, MDR, Acinetobacter take over. So you can kind of predict based upon the duration of hospitalization and the antibiotic exposure what your likely flora are going to be. What are the clinical features of burn wound sepsis? A rapid change in the clinical condition of the burn patient indicates that burn wound infection may be present. What are the typical signs? Fever, other signs of sepsis which are well known to ICU physicians. A change in burn wound appearance is a clue that the burn is the source of the infection, for example, purulent drainage, tenderness, etc. Increased pain and also lack of tolerance of tube feeds. Physical exam is important to localize the site of the, the, the sepsis or the SERS to the burn wound. You have to carefully look at it daily and if you are not looking at it, please request your plastic surgeon to, to carefully look at it. And, and based upon the gross appearance and based upon altered clinical manifestations, you make a final diagnosis of burn wound sepsis. So these are some of the typical appearances when you look at a wound, discoloration, pain, edema, tenderness, a malodorous discharge. These are all typical features of burn wound infection. And once you have spread of infection to the surrounding normal tissue, a cellulitis, that those features will spread as well from the burn wound site to the surrounding area. And finally, the most reliable local sign of burn wound infection is conversion of, a of an area of partial thickness to full thickness necrosis. This indicates that necrosis is worsening and is an indicator of burn wound infection. There are some clinical clues which are not hard and fast but may help you. For instance, Staphylococcus aureus can cause a so-called melting away of the burn wound appearance. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, as the name tells you, can produce blue-green 
uh, uh, blue green appearance and an unusual smell as well. Candida causes small white pustules and herpes simplex can cause punched out holes in previously normal skin. So local signs and characteristics of burn wound infections uh, due to fungi and herpes simplex are important to recognize by careful clinical examination of the local area. Systemic signs. This is similar to your SERS criteria. Severely burned patients may however not manifest a febrile response. So you have to have uh, a very high index of suspicion. Uh, you have to look at not just SERS parameters but also have a clinical sense of what this patient is doing. Uh, the typical signs tachycardia, tachypnea, hypotension, oliguria, unexplained hyperglycemia, thrombocytopenia, these are all not specific for burns but anything in a setting of burns should make you look for sepsis. The lab findings are also not specific for burns. For instance, blood glucose levels go up, white counts can go very high or low, platelet counts fall and the procalcitonin has been studied in this setting but it is really not very reliable. Many studies are still searching for the role of procalcitonin, certainly should not be relied on in isolation in a decision to start antibiotics, perhaps better used in a decision to de-escalate or stop antibiotics. Now the American Burns Association came out with these criteria in 2007 which combined local criteria with systemic criteria to help you decide whether a burn wound infection was present or not. So these are one of the following major criteria, a pathologic infection is confirmed for instance a blood culture grows. If you do a biopsy of burn tissue and you show more than 10 power 5 bacteria per gram of tissue that is a gold local standard for infection. And finally, this is more a clinical criterion improvement after giving antibiotics. So those criteria allow you to make a diagnosis even without a burn wound biopsy. In addition, you need many typical SERS criteria, a fever, tachycardia, tachypnea, hypotension, leukocytosis, hyperglycemia and inability to tolerate tube feeds. None of this is sepsis, none of this is specific to the burn wound setting but in the setting of burns should make you think of burn wound sepsis. So diagnosis, when you suspect this, there are two major diagnostic tests that are recommended. One is a burn wound biopsy and I told you that number 10 power 5, the other thing you look for is histopathology. The 10 power 5 number should be correlated with histopathology showing bacteria in, in, uh, in tissue. And in addition to these, when you have systemic syndrome, you diagnose burn wound infections. So biopsy is the gold standard and should be relied on in all patients. Rarely do you need to get away from biopsy because this is the only reliable way you can diagnose burn wound infection. Histopathology, there are many typical features. For instance, the presence of hemorrhage in unburned tissue, small vessel thrombosis, dense bacterial growth in subescar space or for instance herpes simplex, they will show you intracellular viral inclusions. Similarly, fungi can be picked up especially candida, aspergillus, etc. So always get a burn wound biopsy when your uh, diagnosis is burn wound sepsis. So this is an algorithm, it is a complicated algorithm but basically it tells you when there is clinical suspicion fulfilling the SERS criteria or the American Burn Association criteria, you go for a burn wound biopsy. If that is positive, you treat as a burn wound infection. If that is negative, you look for other sources of sepsis. There are many causes of fever in the ICU. Similarly, the burnt patient may have many other non-burnt sources of fever. Now you have to be careful in distinguishing colonization. Many of these patients are colonized with bacteria, perhaps on the burn wound surface, perhaps in other areas and you need clinical judgment to make sure that you are not treating colonization, you are treating true infection. And certainly similar to all critically ill patients, central line infections, urinary tract infections related to the Foley catheter or ventilator associated pneumonia are the big three in terms of differential diagnoses. But all of the conditions listed on this slide can mimic burn wound sepsis. For instance, the hypermetabolic response to a thermal burn, the SERS itself is an important differential diagnostic criterion. And all these other conditions, pancreatitis to procedure related transient bacteremia can all mimic sepsis. So it is up to you to carefully examine your patient to sort out what is what before you start antibiotics. 
management of burn wound sepsis is divided into initial, systemic and local. Initially you obviously maintain your hemodynamics uh, that is uh, that whatever, whatever uh, critical care syndrome the principles are quite similar. Systemic antibiotic therapy is reserved for those demonstrating severe sepsis or septic shock because you do not want to use so called prophylactic antibiotics. Guidelines are clear cut that in the absence of sepsis there is no role for so called prophylactic antibiotics. These merely shift the spectrum of infections to more drug resistant ones. And the choice of antibiotics depends upon the local antibiogram. It is important to know what are the locally endemic flora in your burn unit and the sensitivity so you can pick your empiric antibiotic therapy correctly. These are just some of the some of the common antibiotics we would use in this situation based upon the anticipated organisms, piperacillin, tazobactam or carbapenem typically covering for ESBLs. You add vancomycin if your incidence of MRSA is high in your unit that is often not the case in many Indian ICUs and you may need to, uh, to add either an aminoglycoside or cholestin if you are seeing a lot of carbapenem resistance in pseudomonas, acinetobacter or enterobacteriaceae. On the other hand patients without systemic sepsis especially early on who just have burned wound cellulitis these are largely caused by gram positive streptococcus staphylococcus. So narrow spectrum agents like cefazolin or clindamycin will often get the job done for you and once you have cultures you obviously either escalate or de-escalate based upon your antimicrobial sensitivities. Local burn care is important initially cleansing, debridement, topical antimicrobial agents and dressings. But what is most important is excision of the burn wound that has kind of changed burn wound care. If you have an unexcised deep burn wound the risk of complications and, and infection is higher than an excised wound. And so you have to involve your plastic surgeon aggressively usually they will, they will be the first ones to push for early excision. Morbidity and mortality remains significant in these infections. It is estimated that 75% of mortality following thermal injuries is directly related to infection. So if these patients die it is usually due to infection. Not only that if you get infected you lose your graft, you may need more surgeries, increase length of stay, increase number of other infections and uh, so lot of issues related to infection. It is very important to prevent and treat these correctly. Prevention early excision and skin grafting that is number one, that is number one. The other things that you can do are early enteral nutrition because the gut is often a source of bowel translocation and tight diabetic control and in addition infection control in a burn unit is of paramount importance. Every burn unit should be architecturally designed to take burns patients. You have to have a contained perimeter to limit through traffic. You have to have individual strict isolation units whenever you have a patient with a multi drug resistant organization uh, organism. Uh, in one study having a single room as opposed to a shared ward delayed colonization by up to 10 days and helps you get your burns therapy done within that time. You have to have cohort nursing if you cannot do individual one on one nursing. Patients who are recovering uh, should be separated from acutely ill patients who often harbor multi drug resistant bacteria. You have to have category specific precautions for the highest risk patients for instance more than 30% burned surface area and for those who are colonized or infected with MDROs and you really have to have strict controls on your environmental standards the standard of air coming in the door opening closing etc. So, so infection control is an entire separate area to be looked at in a burn unit. So in summary examine the burn wound carefully. A change in local appearance of the wound along with systemic signs of sepsis suggests burn wound infections, burn wound sepsis. Differential diagnosis, typical infections in the ICU, central line, VAP and UTI, empiric antibiotics based upon your burn unit antibiogram, aggressive wound excision and early wound closure is crucial. Infection prevention is an entire, is an entire entity in itself to prevent these infections. We will move on to the second segment which is infections related to trauma. So these are the things which I want you to take home from this uh, segment to understand predisposing factors and pathophysiology, what are the common infections, how we diagnose, prevent and treat. So these are some of the reasons why trauma patients get infected. First of all they may have underlying host factors, malnutrition, diabetes etcetera 
trauma related factors which is related to whatever kind of trauma they had, the number of injuries, whether it was contaminated or not, foreign bodies present or not, whether they required multiple blood products or not. And the most important differential diagnosis is the trauma itself. Trauma itself can cause clinical features indistinguishable from sepsis. There is increased cardiac output, there is increased creatinine clearance and there are elevated inflammatory markers. And obviously the entire trauma related surge process is an is a mild to moderate immunodeficiency state which may predispose to infection. So management is subcategorized into these categories, the wound management, so called antibiotic prophylaxis, treatment of wound infections and prevention of hospital acquired infection. Prevention of wound infection first is ABC, your typical critical care ABCs, patients should be warmed, do not use tourniquets as these might impair blood supply to the uh, to the uh, traumatized area, wound toilet and debridement as soon as possible, preferably same day or within 8 hours and antibiotic prophylaxis for deep wounds and other indications as I will shortly show you. The typical antiseptics which are appropriate locally are either povidone iodine or cetrimide with chlorhexidine gluconate. Large quantities of soap and boiled water are entirely appropriate and irrigation in terms of local debridement. Debridement is largely the province of the surgeon but some principles are never close an infected wound immediately, do not close contaminated wounds and clean wounds that are more than 6 hours old. If you do use a local anesthetic, use 1% lidocaine without epinephrine. Management of tetanus prone wounds is something which ICU physicians needs to know. Any puncture type wound, a contaminated wound uh, for a, a, a high velocity missi missile injuries. These are all indications for tetanus prophylaxis. Tetanus prophylaxis is two types, one is tetanus toxoid or tetanus diphtheria toxoid for lower risk and tetanus immune globulin. If you do give both of them for high risk patients, administer them at different sites. Antibiotic prophylaxis after trauma is indicated for select injuries such as contaminated wounds, penetrating wounds, abdominal trauma especially where the bowel is involved lacerations more than 5 centimeters and high risk anatomical sites. So for these injuries you give antibiotic prophylaxis either, as soon as the patient comes in and continue it for throughout the period when you are surgically debrided. And these are some of the typical antibiotic recommendations in these situations, extremity wounds, staphylococcus is the, is the target pathogen, so cefazolin, clindamycin 1 to 3 days penetrating chest injury quite similar, esophageal disruption there is you may have anaerobe, so, so metronidazole is typically added for these patients, penetrating abdominal injury, bowel flora may be there. So till you finish your toileting you, you need a, a first or a second generation cephalosporin with metronidazole, maxillofacial neck wounds cefazolin will do, penetrating brain injury is again skin flora, so cefazolin is recommended, spinal cord injury again cefazolin add metronidazole if an abdominal cavity is involved. In these CNS type injuries you treat for 4 to 5 days or at least till your leaks, your CSF leaks have settled down. So what are some of the common soft tissue infections we see after trauma? These can typically be divided into early and late pathogens, early on you see staph aureus, streptococcus, typical skin flora, late onset infections are due to hospital acquired flora and in addition you have a whole range of necrotizing fasciitis syndromes anaerobic streptococcal myositis, intra-abdominal infection, clostridial myonecrosis. So often these are suggested by either local suppuration, local crepitation, bulle or the presence of systemic instability or hemodynamic compromise out of proportion to the local appearance should make you suspect a necrotizing infection. So wound infections, soft tissue, it is usually staph or strep bowel breach you need to add gram negatives or anaerobes. So be careful about these patients, you can often underdose antibiotics, these patients are often young and they have an increased creatinine clearance, so use high end antibiotics especially if you, if these patients are sick or you see them initially on, they really need high, higher end of their dosage, recommended dosage. So in addition to the site of trauma, these patients can get other typical ICU infections, pneumonia, central line infections, urinary tract infections, CNS infections especially in penetrating neurotrauma or where, you, where, where, the, where a foreign body has to be placed, sinusitis, empyema, surgical site infections. So the differential diagnosis includes all these conditions. 
Diagnosis of the source of infection in a traumatized patient is always a diagnostic challenge. First problem, is it SIRS related to the trauma or is it true infection? The general principle is closer to the time of trauma, SIRS is more likely. If you are if you're seeing SIRS a week, say, after the initial trauma, it is unlikely that the initial trauma is the cause. And again, infection versus colonization. So, imaging studies have many practical problems in these patients. They have fixators, etc. They have metal and they cannot always be shifted. So, you have to rely on clinical judgment. Inflammatory markers, again, WBC count, procalcitonin are not specific. They can go up in SIRS as well. Blood cultures are very valuable. A positive blood culture is usually significant, but again, the sensitivity is low. And other cultures, for instance, from the endotracheal tube or from the local area, often require clinical correlation to sort out colonization versus infection. How do you prevent in these patients, infections in these patients? Pull out the lines, extubate, remove the Foley catheter, keep the central line uh, in just for the minimum required duration, have your typical ICU bundles in place, stewardship and minimize transfusion. Each unit of blood you transfuse increases your risk of infection, so minimize transfusions. So in summary, Traumatized patients should have their soft tissue infections promptly debrided. Most patients will require short duration, narrow spectrum antibiotic prophylaxis and distinguishing SIRS from sepsis can be challenging and requires clinical judgment. The last part of this section is zoonotic infections. Now, these are some of the things which I will be talking to you about. Many of these zoonotic infections are covered in, in other areas. So, these are some of the specific areas I will be focusing on risk factors and diagnosis and treatment. Now, this is a large number of zoonoses which are found worldwide, but I have just underlined or circled the ones that are seen commonly in India. For instance, Japanese encephalitis, dengue virus, scrub typhus. KFD, Kyasanur forest disease in selected parts of the country, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, which is more widespread than we thought it is, Leptospira, which is seen all over the country, rabies, Chandipura virus, and even avian influenza virus. We have not seen avian influenza in humans in India, but it is an important zoonotic consideration. So, see, these are some of the things that should go through your mind in the appropriate community acquired patient. A few words on rabies. Uh, Dogs, cats can transmit rabies, bats can cause rabies, but bat associated rabies has never been reported in India. The incubation period can be very long, so it is very important to ask for a history of a bite or contact with an animal even up to 1 to 3 months following the time of presentation in patients with unexplained neurological symptoms. There are certain factors that influence uh, the rapidity of symptom onset closer to the brain, for instance, an upper extremity or a facial bite, the size of the inoculum, a bite is worse than a lick for instance, and obviously the vaccination status of the biting animal, which is never reliably obtained by the history that you take. In the intensive care settings, there are two types of presentation, the typical furious rabies, which is the majority of cases, or the dumb or paralytic rabies, which is often missed which is missed as Guillain-Barre syndrome or other causes of encephalitis with brainstem involvement. CNS symptoms may be preceded by prodromal period where they often have non-specific agitational symptoms or perhaps even paresthesia at the site of the bite. So, these are important clues that this could be rabies. In the neurological period, classic features such as hydrophobia are often preceded by hyperactivity, uh, increased autonomic system activity. So, so these are, so rabies has a fairly typical clinical presentation, the furious variant. But what is missed is the so called dumb, vari, dumb rabies, which can often be treated uh, as something else uh, for a while before the diagnosis is made. So, any patient with unexplained encephalitis, especially with brainstem involvement, please think of rabies in the intensive care setting. Um, there are many, many factors in the differential diagnosis, especially when you see this so called paralytic rabies. For instance, West Nile encephalitis, typical Guillain-Barre syndrome can present in this way. And uh, if you cannot make the diagnosis by day 4 or day 5, any patient with encephalitis, the only foolproof way is to consider rabies in all these patients. You can actually do many, many different tests. There are referral centers. For instance, Nimhans in India, in Bangalore is the national reference center for rabies. 
you can send serum, CSF, a punch biopsy from the nape of the nep and in fact any sample which they can potentially use to detect rabies antigen or antibody. Moving on to dengue, dengue is quite a common syndrome especially in younger patients. Uh, this is the classification of dengue as per the WHO in 2009. In the ICU setting, we typically see severe dengue which is associated either with bleeding or with shock syndrome or with severe organ involvement, for instance, severe hepatitis or encephalopathy. Uh, this is the diagnostic profile in dengue. We often use a combination of these tests early on antigenemia or PCRs are positive, later on IgM antibodies after about day 5 or so turn positive. So, it, so it's important to interpret your tests based upon the time you draw your sample. Treatment of dengue is generally straightforward with hydration, with crystalloids, there is, there is no, no significant advantage of colloids in this setting. Platelet transfusions are reserved for the patient who is either bleeding or whose count is less than 10,000. There is no role for prophylactic platelet transfusions if the count is above that number and no role for steroids or other immunomodulatory therapies. Japanese encephalitis is another important zoonosis in India and typically you suspect this in a patient from a rural area or from an urban area where the appropriate vector epidemiology is there, mosquitoes, pigs and rice farms. That is where the, you, that's the history that you need to ask to suspect this diagnosis. Uh, often these patients present with non-specific encephalitis features, but the MRI may help you. You may see bilateral thalamic and basal ganglia hyperintensities, CSF shows lymphocytic pleocytosis, diagnosis most public health laboratories will assist you by doing IgM, both serum and CSF. So in summary, zoonoses commonly encountered in India include rabies, encephalitis, scrub typhus and leptospirosis. The diagnosis of rabies should be suspected in all patients <coughs> with unexplained encephalitis including flaccid paralysis. Thank you.